there, everybody. Welcome to our fantastic green chemistry webinar. We are so excited to dive into this important concept with you all. Uh, we will go ahead and get started here in a minute, but we want to give folks some time to settle into the into the Zoom room. Um, now's a great time to grab some water, stay hydrated. It's summer, it's hot. Um, and let me go ahead and work on the chat section here because I would love for you all to navigate to the bottom of your Zoom window. Go ahead and click that chat button. It looks like a little chat bubble. Um, when you click that, Go ahead and let me know um, what is the most exciting thing you've done this summer. So this could be related to chemistry. This could be an awesome hike you took. Maybe it's like a fact about the world of chemistry you just found out. Let me know what it is in the chat box. Um, oh, wow. So News um, is announcing that he had his first grandchild. That is going to be a hard one to top. <laughs> And as you are um, putting your answers in the chat, go ahead and make sure it's set to everyone can see your chat bu bubble. Uh, we're going to be answering your questions live during this webinar. So we wanna make sure your chat is set to everyone so we don't seem like we're talking to ourselves when we answer your questions. So make sure it's set to everyone so we can all see your question and, and learn together. Let's see, we've got a vacation to Foley Beach, South Carolina. Beautiful, I'm sure that was incredible. Hike in Yellowstone, I love that. Old Faithful is such a sight to see. A book festival, holy cow, that is so cool. And a nuclear power plant, all right. You all are making the most of the summer months. That is awesome. That's amazing. Well. We are at uh, a minute past the hour, and just to make the most out of our time together today, um, we're going to go into some housekeeping, and then I'll pass you off to our fabulous presenters, um, if we don't mind going to the next slide. Oh, sorry. No worries. Maybe, is it the one after this, maybe? No, I don't, oh, I think Noosa, Noosa missed the housekeeping slide. Well, that's okay, because oh, I have it memorized. I, I <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right. Well, no worries. No worries. Can you tell um, us? Yeah. <laughs> um, there's two important things that I want to cover with you. First and foremost, you will get a recording of this webinar. It's going to be live both on our YouTube channel as well as our website. Uh, as soon as it's ready, you're going to receive an email with a link to it. So keep an eye on your email um, and we'll get that to you as soon as possible. It usually takes about three to five business days. In the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and drop our resources folder into the chat so that you have access to all of the documents that we're talking about today. Um, so keep an eye on the chat box for that. And uh, the second thing I want to cover with you is that um, we will be answering your questions. So please be putting your questions in the chat. Um, we've got folks keeping an eye on that to answer your questions. And if we happen to not get to it, you can absolutely email us, give us a call, use our chat box, whatever works best for you. We are here to help. And with that, I will pass you off to Noose and Melissa. Thank you so much for joining us today. All right. Thanks, Dylan. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll, we'll get right into the green chem stuff here in a bit, but just to, if you haven't met us, uh, my name is Noose Hissom. I'm a chemistry education specialist here at Vernier. I taught chemistry um, in Maryland for 34 years and have been using Vernier equipment for nearly all the time that I taught. And in 2016, I came to the office here near Portland and uh, have been working on um, curriculum, written a couple of lab manuals and uh, tech support for teachers, help them learn how to use our stuff and, and you know, what kinds of experiments you can do, you know, with our stuff. Melissa, do you want to say a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Melissa. I'm also one of the chemists here. I will be uh, answering all your questions in chat. So please feel free to throw all your questions in chat. And um, also take a look at that resources folder that Dylan just put the link in um, because we have a lot of great resources for you for today's webinar, some brand new experiments. So take it away, Noose. Okay. All right. So what we've been 
playing around with now for a little while and finally starting to get serious about it is this uh, idea of green chemistry. Um, and uh, ACS has this nice little um, pamphlet that you can download for free. And But the idea is pretty, in, a little, in some ways it's common sense, um, you know, what can you do to teach your concepts effectively, but not necessarily use materials that are either hard to come by or hard to dispose of or might be dangerous uh, to handle? Um, and, you know, being a high school chemistry teacher, you know, can I teach chemistry with materials that I can buy in a hardware store or grocery store? And in many cases, you can be very effective um, with those types of materials. And so what we're hoping to do is to come up with a we're gearing this kind of towards college Chem 101, freshman chem, this could be very, these activities would be very appropriate for AP or an upper level chemistry classes as well, uh, but not introductory stuff for high school. This is going to be a little bit higher level and we're going to count on you, the instructors, to, you know, fill in the gaps and, and that sort of thing. But also, we're, we don't want to rehash experiments that we've already done. So we're looking for ideas and, and, um, and, and some things that would be interesting for for students and 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 teachers but also teach those basic concepts that uh you want to be able to do in uh freshman chem so that's what we're after here so what we did was we looked at these these um ideas in in um green chemistry and these ones that i've got highlighted up here are kind of the top ones that came out in our minds is, you know, what, if you're teaching freshman chem, what sorts of things would you be most interested in? Um, and how could you, you know, use green chemistry to help you approach that? So these are just some of the ideas of those 12 precepts that ACS has put out um, about green chemistry. And so you can see that these things are, you know, make sense. You don't want to hurt your students, but, and you want to teach them well, but you want to do something that, you know, that is very appropriate and less hazardous and that sort of thing. So that's where we're going uh, with this activity. So um, there's no rhyme or reason as far as the order of the experiments. We kind of are writing these as we come up with them. And these two that we're going to be doing today um, they are going to be, if you're familiar with our lab manuals and our advanced lab manual, the, there's two experiments back to back where you standardize an, a base and then use that standard base to titrate an acid, but it's sodium hydroxide and potassium hydrogen phthalate and, and hydrochloric acid. And, and, you know, they're not particularly not green, um, but they you know, they can be more hazardous. And in that first experiment, uh, students make a nine molar solution. So pretty, pretty concentrated. Could we do the same sort of thing with, um, materials that are safer and easier to come by and easier to dispose of? And it turns out we can. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do the second of the two experiments live today, and then I'm going to share with you the information from the first experiment. So um, the other thing we're going to do is we, you know, how, how many people have not titrated? I mean, you've, if you're teaching chemistry, of course you have. So we're going. there are two titrations. The first titration in experiment one is for the standardization, and we're going to be standardizing vinegar. And we're going to talk about that because there's obviously some limitations there. But in the second experiment, we're going to do a conductivity titration. And boy, this one is a bit of an eye opener if you haven't done it the way we're going to do it. And I, uh, I have a an example of a traditional one that you can also do um, in kind of a more green way instead of using barium salts, which is what you know has been kind of traditional for a conductivity titration. So let's kind of look at the experiment. And while we're doing it, we can talk about it. And by all means, I would love to, to hear your impressions as we're doing it. So if you want to throw stuff in the chat, please do that because this is so new that we don't have a lot of feedback yet. Um, so in the first experiment, if you go to that link that uh, Dylan shared, and it'll be it'll be in the uh, 
presentation when you when you get the presentation there's a bunch of of things here there's experiment 1 and experiment 2 and what you're seeing here is experiment 1 this is the standardization of the vinegar using pickling lime which turns out the first I'd heard of it, you know, it was a few months ago. Um, it's, it's calcium hydroxide and um, it's used, I suppose, in pickling. I don't know that I've ever done that before. What I liked about this, the way we wrote it, was that it's a little different than the standard titration curve that um you normally see in the textbook, mostly because it starts high and goes low, and it's a little bit different. And if you're an AP teacher, you know, a few years ago, there was actually a question on the exam that, you know, was like this. It was the opposite of what, you know, mostly what students mostly see. And that data is the data that, you know, I got when, when I did this titration. And then in the second experiment, we're going to do a conductivity titration. And I'm going to hold off on this discussion because honestly, folks, watching a titration go is like watching paint dry. So I'm going to get this thing started and then we'll go ahead and see, you know, we'll talk more about this and what's going on. So let me bring up my camera and my setup here so you can see what's happening. I've got a conductivity sensor. I've got my standardized uh, white vinegar. We'll talk more about this in a bit. Notice the date on there. And I've got a drop counter. And of course, you could do this, you know, with a manual titration. I've already, to save time, because we have an hour, um, I've already connected the sensors. Uh, our GoDirect sensors um, can connect by Bluetooth or they can connect by USB. I've got them connected by Bluetooth. Let me turn a meter on here so you can kind of see what's going on. Um, for this experiment, the the standard uh, pardon me, calibration on the conductivity sensor is perfectly good enough. Um, but uh, for the drop counter, you pretty much have to, to um, calibrate that sensor every time you use it. Uh, but there's a trick. And one of the things we put in the experiment to save space, actually, we could say the opposite. We could say we left out of the experiment to save space, was the the step-by-step -step instructions on how to calibrate the sensor because it tells you right in the software. The software, if you're not familiar with it, is uh, our graphical analysis software. And so if you tap on the little meter at the bottom here that says conductivity, you get an option for calibrating, not conductivity, I said that wrong, for volume. And I'm going to go to calibrate. And it literally walks you through the process. So one of the things we did in these slightly more advanced experiments is we didn't write all copy this and over again. Uh, students can follow the instructions. All you need is a graduated cylinder. And it's easy to do. But here's the trick that a lot of people don't realize. And that's this other column here that says manual. So these... Um, these sensors that I have in front of me, that you'll you may notice there's a piece of masking tape at the top with a number written on. Here's another one that I had in my lab bench this morning and I grabbed it. You'll notice the numbers are not the same. When you go through the process of calibrating the conductivity sensor, it's kind of a almost a misnomer because the conductivity sensor is about the dumbest sensor we have. All it ever does is tell you if something is blocking this gap. That's all it ever does. And so what you're really keeping track of when you're calibrating it is the drop size as it comes through this little plastic tip. So when you are calibrating these, after you have finished calibrating them, write that information on something that stay, I would suggest all of these pieces stay together because it's really the tip. And then that data you can enter manually and you don't have to go through the whole calibration. So this one that I have on the, on the stir station, it says 21.68. So I'm going to change this default value here to 21.68. And lo and behold, my volume is now calibrated. So now let's set the experiment up. For the drop counter, what I need to do is I'm going to put my standardized vinegar in there. And you want to make sure these valves are closed to start with. And it doesn't really matter how much, but I like to fill it up pretty, pretty full. 
Um, lots of discussions that people have about the, the pressure on the end of the sensor and how does that change the size of the drops. And for most of the people, for mo what most people do, it doesn't really matter. With our setup, the bottom valve is really an on-off switch. I'm going to turn it on completely for now. The top valve, you want to adjust the drop rate to be at less than one drop a second. Now, we have a limited amount of time. Um, and so I'm going to have it go a little faster, but what you want to do is get that thing to a nice slow rate. These sensors, conductivity isn't quite as bad as, as pH, but these sensors have a slow response rate. So you want that drip rate to be relatively slow. Then what you want is you want to set the, um, bottom valve off. So it's basically an on off switch. And so then when I'm ready to count, when I'm ready to collect data, all I have to do is turn that bottom valve back on. So the drop counter is ready to go. It's been calibrated. Now I need to put my unknown and my unknown in this case is ammonia. So we chose that for a couple of reasons. One of the main reasons was this is relatively easy to get. It's cheap. It's, um, it's easy to dispose of, uh, relatively safe. I mean, I wouldn't be wafting those vapors into into my face but you know if you have a decently ventilated space it's probably going to be okay in the experiment it says to use five milliliters so i'm going to try to do that pipette would be better at this point but um now the other thing you want to do with this setup is um the the the, the conductivity probe has a wide gap between the two two electrodes so there's two graphite electrodes in there and so you want to cover that completely so once you've established the amount of material that you're going to titrate then you're going to put in some distilled water until that whole gap is is covered and of course, that doesn't change the moles, so students might get a little concerned about that, but you know we put five milliliters in, and you want to get a nice stir rate. You know, you want we don't want splashing, but we want it we, because it's a slow reacting sensor, we want the stir rate to be nice and brisk, I think is what I wrote in the experiment. Let's get the drop counter, the, the reservoir aligned. You need to get that aligned above the slot. And I'm pretty close to ready to go and everything's lined up. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start collecting data and nothing's going to happen until a drop falls through the drop counter. So on off switch on the bottom, let's turn it on. There's a little red LED may, not, may or may not be able to see that in the camera. And every time a drop falls through, then the, uh, LED flashes to let you know. And if you're one of our tech support suggestions for teachers is, you know, just run, if it's not working properly, run your finger through there and see if that red LED um, is flashing. Now, what's amusing about this one is if you've ever done a conductivity titration, is this one's backwards from the way most people have seen conductivity titrations. Let me show you what I mean. Most commonly when I did this, when I was teaching, oh, I hate this too. The software defaults to these big fat, we'll leave it that way, but it's sometimes I don't like the way that looks. But this, the let me get back to my point. The um, conductivity titrations, more commonly when I did them, it would be two materials that formed a, an insoluble product. And so what would happen is that the conductivity would drop as the product um, precipitated out. So this is the one I did this morning with um, sodium carbonate, uh, washing soda, and calcium chloride. And you can see in the little video I shot down here that this white solid calcium carbonate is being formed. And as that's being formed, the conductivity is dropping until all of the limiting reactant is consumed. And then as the titrant keeps dropping in there, the conductivity goes back up again. This, this is a very common um, titration. And so if you've done these sorts of things, you've seen these before and a great discussion of solubility and, you know, what's causing the, the conductivity and so forth. This one is a little different, right? 
what's going on here? There's no precipitate forming. The conductivity appears to be going up. I mean, not just appears, it is going up. And so what's happening here? I think this is a ripe opportunity to talk about, we have two aqueous compounds with ions in, in both. Uh, we've, we, we're kind of simplifying it a bit to talk about, you know, uh, acetic acid from the vinegar and um, ammonium hydroxide, which was formed when the ammonia dissolved in the water. Um, and so you've got, you know, those are going to ionize to some or dissociate to some extent, but then also both of those are weak. They're a weak acid and a weak base. So you've got that kind of competing thing. And so I just thought this was just marvelous in the way that it develops um, just because of, of those those uh, factors, and then it's also a two to one thing. So you know you've got you got ammonium hydroxide, and you're and you're doing that against. Oh, this one's not. This one is. I'm sorry. The first one was. Uh, and so now all of a sudden the conductivity has kind of leveled off, and so at that point where the conductivity leveled off, the the re, the reactant in uh, limiting reactant has been well. You can make some arguments, but it's certainly been consumed to some extent. And so that's caused a big change in the conductivity. Um, and so we would call that the endpoint uh, for the reaction. So I just think that's a great opportunity to talk about something a little bit different that's going on in the solution. Um, you know, because now since the limiting reactant, which would have been in this case, the ammonia has been to some extent uh, consumed at least in its in its original state um you know we we now have a different number of ions that are available in solution and so the the conductivity of the solution has changed and i probably have enough data here now so that we can do the analysis um so interesting and different right um and, and you, could you titrate this traditionally with a ph probe of course you could um i'm going to turn off the bottom valve and then it, it, even though it appears to have stopped collecting data the date software is still going but at this point we're ready to do the analysis so i can stop collecting the data and so to find this volume we're going to do kind of a neat thing in the um, in the software. Let me, we don't need all this other stuff down here anymore. So I'm going to go ahead and close those. So we, we have a little more real estate to work on. So Melissa, any thoughts, questions, concerns? Um, yeah, we've had quite a few questions. So um, I know we didn't have the instructions for the burette, but if you... I don't know if you're about to go on to something else because the titration's already done. But if you have some time at the end to kind of uh, sure. show those steps, uh, sure. I think that would be helpful. Yeah, and we, we've done this before where we will create both versions of an experiment. Uh, you know, doing this manually with a burette would be perfectly appropriate and um, can definitely be done. And I can show you how, that, how to set up the software in order to do that. Um, the other thing that, well, let's, let's analyze this and then we'll go back and we'll look at uh, some, we'll discuss some things about uh, household products and what you want to be careful with. If we want to find that point where the limiting reactant was consumed, um, you can have your students just analyze the graph and just kind of bounce around and kind of make a guess, you know, about where that is. And we probably wouldn't be off by too much realizing that it's at that inflection point. If you want to be a little more careful about how you do that, you can do a regression line on one side so I'll grab that and I'll do a regression line there. So a linear fit. And so that's the linear line on this side of the in inflection point. I'll take the most linear part of this plot and select that part of the graph on the left side. So maybe something like that, kind of equivalent to the other one and do a linear plot there. And then what I would have my students do, and it's kind of your call, you might have your students develop this for themselves or you might walk them through this. We did not 
put these instructions in the experiment on purpose. We wanted students to try to figure some of this out on their own. But the the what we're after here is the value of X. We're after that, you know, that point at which these two regression lines are crossing. And so if we and of course, at that point, Y is the value for Y is equal. So if they take the two the two uh, regression equations and set them equal to each other and solve for X with the slope of the right side over here and the slope of the left side over here and the Y intercept, um, then that X value that they solve for will be the volume of that point. If they, if you do this, this set of experiments as a sequence, where you do experiment number one, which was this one, so you've tight, you you have determined the um, concentration of the of the vinegar. And so you've already established that you've standardized it. And so then in the second experiment you do, and this is, this was data from another sample file, um, but it looks like it's pretty similar. Let me go back. I just wasn't paying as close attention, but let me see. Yeah. It looks like this is around eight point something. So similar to the one we just did. Um, you can determine the volume. And then from that, you can determine the concentration of the ammonia. Um, and so it's a kind of an interesting way to do an analysis. The actual, uh, this part of the analysis is the same whether you use a pH probe or a conductivity probe, because all we're after is that value. Now, one thing that we just we deter we figured out when we first started doing this was household materials. Uh, household materials don't carry the same sort of stringency as as reagents you know do and so you'll find and the reason why all of these have dates on them let me get the camera back up is whoops come on camera why didn't you come back up let me see am i there it is uh, all these materials have dates on them and the reason is that we discovered i guess we should have anticipated it that um that things you know that you buy from the grocery store don't you know and and of course yeah, you know, the the ammonia's got got you know it's actually got ammonia dissolved in water, and you take the cap off, and you're you're losing some of the ammonia. The even the vinegar though, we we noticed older vinegar is different, even if it's white wine. And then the other thing is different vinegars, right? If you're using a uh, you know like an apple cider vinegar or a red you know wine vinegar, they're all slightly different. Um, uh, Melissa or somebody found a pickling vinegar. I had never heard of it before, um, but it has a higher concentration of acetic acid in it. So it might be amusing to have different groups determine in experiment number one what the concentration of the 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 um, acetic acid is in different kinds of vinegar. Um, and so, but the nice thing about this is, is all of these materials are easily obtained and easily, easily disposed of. And so kind of a nice feature of the green chemistry. In the pickling line, by the way, you know, this is this is calcium hydroxide. And so you might want to try to dry this in a drying oven because you're going to weigh this in experiment number one. And when you do that, you know, if it's picked up a little moisture, I remember when I used to do the potassium hydrogen phthalate one, uh, you know, I put the KHP in a in a in a desiccator overnight just to kind of get it a little drier. Um, so, you know, kind of an interesting, interesting way to do things. And then, of course, everything goes down the drain when you're done. Um, the question was, can you do this same set of experiments with just with a burette? Of course you could. Let me show you that setup. But before I do that, are there any other questions about this? Okay, before I do that, let me I'm going to save it just so that if something comes up later, I can go back and get it. So let's see, this is uh, experiment two. I'll just save that. And so let me start a new experiment. And what I'll do is I'll get rid of the drop counter. Now, the I don't have a burette here, but I can pretend that this, uh, this is the burette and I'll get rid of the drop counter. So what I'm gonna do is take it out, drop counter. So all I have is the conductivity um, uh, sensor. So you'll notice that if if you most of the time when you connect a vernier sensor, 
most of the time, they will be the sensor against time. And in this experiment, if you're doing this with, uh, with um, um, a burette, time is not appropriate. We need volume again, but this time it's not going to be automatic. We're going to be entering the volume manually. So what you would do is you would tap on the bottom left where it says mode, and you would change from time-based to event-based. And so that event would be the volume. So you would just type in the vo type in volume, and then the units might most likely are going to be milliliters. And so you're manually setting up what the drop counter did automatically. And of course, you're reading the volume from the um, the burette. And I'll try to do it a little bit here with the uh, with the uh, drop counter, the drop counter reservoir, so you can kind of get an idea. And so if I had reset everything in here, I guess there's we've got time, so there's no reason why I couldn't do that. Um, let me go ahead and rinse these. You'll, I'll apologize. I'm going to rinse, but it's not going to be perfect. Um, but you can at least get, get a feel for how to do this manually without a drop counter. So pretend that that's clean. Sorry. <laughs> pretend my, my, my uh, conductivity probe is clean. And so what I'm going to do is put my ammonia. Wait a minute. I have, to, I have it in a beaker. They put a sample of ammonia in there. So the setup, this part's identical. The only difference is going to be when we're collecting data, and you'll see that in just a second. Let me go ahead and put some distilled water in there so the probe is reading appropriately. I'll make a bigger meter on the screen so you can see what I'm doing. So let me get the meter bigger. So what's going to happen here is, I'll get the, spin, the stir going, is when you collect data in this setup, um, what's going to happen is that it's going to wait for you. So I'm going to click collect. And what it wants me to do is tap this keep button. And when I do that, it's going to ask me, well, how much titrant did you add? So it'll come up and say, well, what did you put in? Well, I haven't put any in yet, so I'll type zero. And it'll plot that point. And then when you're doing this type of titration, my suggestion is that you have your students do kind of a rough titration. Like I'm going to put a whole milliliter in and I, I wasn't careful checking my readings on here. So I apologize. It's not bad. It's right on 50. So that's not actually bad. So I'll put a milliliter of titrant in. Let me do. This is not a very precise device. So. I'll have to, you'll have to excuse me here. I don't know how good this is going to be, but there's a milliliter. And so we'll let the, um, let it spin up. Now, when you're doing this, you're watching this big meter until that value stabilizes. When it stabilizes, you tap keep and you type in what you put in. And let's pretend I put in a milliliter because with this reservoir, it's not that easy to do. But let me get another milliliter in there. So... Let's pretend that's a milliliter. Okay. Notice that the reading is changing. So you would wait until that reading stabilizes. And let's call that stable. And now I've put in two milliliters. Okay. And you can see it's kind of forming that very that similar graph that I had before. Let's get another milliliter in. So does that answer the question for the folks that were interested in uh, manual titration? Melissa, was that kind of what they were looking for? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. I think they just wanted to make sure that it could be done with a burette and how you would set that up. And so, yeah, I think you you answered that question. Calcium um, hydroxide issue with calcium reacting with dissolved carbon dioxide to form. Yeah. Um, so oh, that was a long time ago, News. There's been a lot of questions since then. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. I haven't been keeping up. I apologize. Yeah, there's not going to be a ton of calcium of, 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 um, carbon dioxide in the, in the water, but there certainly will be some, uh, but that's always the case, no matter what kind of titration you're doing. So um, is the pro version of ground? Okay. All right. Did you want me to answer any of these questions? I don't, I think I've got You'd it probably under answer control. It. Yeah. Um, right now we're talking about actually ammonia. Um, Olivia brought up an interesting point about how ammonia is synthesized, like how it's made just in 
chemical manufacturing, um, that it's at a very high heat, which is really bad for energy efficiency. Um, and so it would be, would it be better to use a different reagent other than ammonia? And I think that's like a really good point. Um, and we, and we could look into that, but I do also kind of agree that because it's so safe at the end, it still outweighs some of those cons, um, particularly because you're doing the entire experiment at room temperature and you're not having to, you know, put energy into the system. So it, it does help mitigate some of those initial factors. Um, but I think that's a really important point to especially bring out to your students is like how a lot of these chemicals are manufactured. How are they stored? How are they transported? Um, and because they're making it in such bulk, like you're buying store-bought ammonia. So the energy required is going to be for a very short period of time. And you're going to get a lot of volume out of it versus making a, uh, you know, pure hydrochloric acid, one gallon, five gallon jug for your classroom in small batches or things like that, which also have similar, um, so similar transit or safety issues. Um, but I think it's really important to look at all of those things and, we, and, we would love... and I think have your students do that too. Like right. give fact, them that's those what I was details say. and have them do that cost benefit. We uh, we actually threw a little of that into the into the experiment. When you get to the end of the experiment, there's discussion about, you know, why would you, you know, what sort of green chemistry precepts or whatever uh, does this experiment take advantage of? Um, and so in the in the pre lab, we have we actually have a link to that. I believe we put the link to that uh, that document, didn't we? I, thought... in, I think it's in the first. First okay, which is experiment number one. Yeah. yeah. And so the idea being to have students start thinking about things like that, because it's not just the chemical that's in front of you. It's also how did it get there? You know, I think it's a very good comment is, you know, how was this made? Is this a byproduct that was going to be throw away? Or is this something that was specifically designed and made for this? And so, you know, there's that energy discussion. Um, but there's also the waste that was that was as a result of making that. Uh, I remember talking to students about rechargeable, you know, batteries and things. And it's great that we can run cars on batteries, but what does it take to make a lithium battery? <laughs> I mean, there's a there's a lot of discussion there. So, um, so yeah, the green side of things, boy, you could go crazy with that discussion. Um, and what I liked about this one was just the um, the unusualness of. These two, let me go back to the presentation. You know, the if you look at the equation for this one, let's go back, where, where was it here? This one, um, when you're looking at this, you know, you've got two aqueous substances here. So in its, I didn't put any, I did not put an, 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 a, a, a forwards back arrow, but you know, you've got, you know, basically four ions and you're coming over here making water and then you're making two ions. So as you're adding the titrant, you're actually adding more ions and not precipitating that much out. Um, and so this, con this, this conductivity is going up, but then once the limiting reactant, which in this case would have been the ammonia is, well, you have to think about is it completely consumed because it's going to form an equilibrium, but, but, you know, it's definitely consumed to some extent. And so then now you're, you're, you have less ions in solution um, from than before. And so this thing, you're still adding the titrant. Um, so, but the conductivity distinctly changes. And so I think it's kind of a neat discussion, um, you know, for the, for the, for the concept of, you know, what's going on in here and then add on to it, the green chemistry discussion. So I did, like I said, um, I, this morning in the shower, I think I think best in the shower <laughs> is could I do the same sort of thing with a precipitation titration? And yes, you can, you can. And then what I used for these was just, um, um, washing soda and calcium chloride. Uh, talk about a temperature issue, um, not only when you make the calcium chloride solution, but also when these react, their delta H is negative. So, so it does get a little warm. And so that's a whole different discussion. I'm definitely looking for ideas, green chemistry ideas for some sort of heat of reaction or heat of solution um, 
uh, experiments that we haven't already done. So, so anyway, any other thoughts, questions, concerns? It is summer. I don't want to keep people in here that don't uh, um, that, <laughs> that probably have other things they may want to do. So these two experiments that we we put in the folder, they are as as new as possibly can be. We had our editor drop them in while we were starting the webinar. So these files, if you look at the time date on there, it's like right at the beginning of the webinar. Yeah. <laughs> so these are very, very new. Yeah. So we would love to that point, we would love any feedback you have um, on them. And there's still a few things we want to add to experiment to in terms of the pre-lab and post-lab analysis. Uh, but but any feedback you have on the mezzes, please let us know. We're we're envisioning probably around ten or twelve experiments for freshman chem that would use different probes and different concepts, and um, but also be adhere to the the twelve precepts of uh, of uh, green chemistry from ACS, um, and try to you know approach things from a little bit different direction than using things that either are expensive or hard to get rid of or, you know, or, or potentially dangerous for students. And so this is our first foray into that. And uh, we'd, we'd love to hear from you all. How pure is store-bought pickling lime? Well, the, 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 the container, let me bring the camera back up. Uh, the container says contains, I think this one says 100% calcium hydroxide. Where did I see that? Yep. Ah, uh, you can't really, it's teeny weeny writing, but it says on there, uh, calcium hydroxide, and then it says lime. And I don't remember now, is it, is it slaked lime that's calcium oxide and regular lime is calcium hydroxide or vice versa? But that's all it says. It doesn't say anything else. So I'm taking that to mean 100%, um, whether that's True or not, I mean, I, my guess is that it's hydroscopic, so it's probably picking up a little bit of moisture. Um, that's why you might, because you're going to weigh that in the first experiment, what you're going to do is weigh the sample that you're going to uh, use to standardize the vinegar. Um, you might want to dry it in a in a um, um, desiccator, not a drying oven. You don't want to decompose it uh, to calcium oxide, but if you put it in a desiccator, might get better results. These are what they are. And so how good a results do you want? Um, it would be nice to get consistent results, but um, are these going to give you the same kind of results that you know, chemicals from Aldrich or, or Flynn or something? No, they're not. Then you're going to find that the values, even from student to student, are going to probably vary. Um, but is that the important thing or is the important thing understanding how to, you know, titrate and do these calculations and apply these, these green chemistry principles? I think that's maybe more important than, you know, if we're off by 5% or something like that. Um, it's, but it's your call as to what you, how important you think that is. Um, any other thoughts before we kind of get towards the end? So much good feedback from you all. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah definitely. Um, news, make sure you show our uh, email. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Chem chemistry at Rainier.com. If you That's have why any Melissa other... needs to be there because I tend to forget. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I think we're giving away a sensor before everyone leaves, too. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be here to win. So, um, but just be aware Melissa and I are instructors. Uh, she was a college college instructor. I was a high school instructor. We have done a lot of this stuff and we're, we're here for you. If you run into trouble with our stuff, please don't hesitate to let us know because uh, we're here for you. Multiple ways that you can contact us. And yeah, the last Last thing is we are going to give away to those that are still here. Um, we're going to give away one conductivity sensor and Dylan has some magical way that she can do that kind of randomly. So I'm going to turn it over to Dylan. Perfect. Yes, I uh, entered everyone's names into a random name generator, and I have go gone ahead and selected today's winner. So um, Lordy C will be winning the GoDirect conductivity probe. Congratulations. Um, I'm going to go ahead and shoot an email to you, just getting some important shipping address questions figured out, and we will get your sensor sent to you. So congratulations. Very exciting stuff. All right. Well, if there's 
not too much more if anybody has anything that would they'd like to throw in there um yeah yeah we're a little bit we're done a little bit early but we talked about this and i anybody that knows me knows i can talk forever but at the same time it's the summer and we thought you know probably want to go down to the pool or something so we really appreciate i think i saw 30 some people or something and so that's great you know and if there's anything we can do to help um by the way if you're going to be um on near the near the east coast uh, melissa and i are going to be at university of kentucky next week right it's a week and a half uh for the bcc conference so if you're going to be be there we would love to meet you um so come by the booth and um, melissa's even doing a, a cool exp a cool experiment using a, a cyclic voltammetry system that that we just came out with so so which i don't know melissa is that green we're using yes it is actually. we're using i solution i and and, mm -hmm. uh, we use saline solution as the buffer and acetaminophen um and and uh which is also another like eh, I, i'll have to look up further guidelines around it i'm not ready to say it is but it's definitely much better than a lot of the other cyclic voltammetry experiments which use like ferrocyanide and <laughs> ruthenium yeah. compounds and stuff like that so as far as electrochemistry experiments goes it's definitely on the greener side but um because of such the positive feedback from all of this um i'm definitely going to look into adding some of that to my workshop sounds good all right folks so so happy to see you all and let us know what we can do to help otherwise have a great rest of your summer bye everyone thank you